Uh, well, it is a joy and an honour to be with you this evening. Thank you, David, for the invitation. Um, uh, I, just in a, a small part of uh, Methodism at the minute, uh, have a, an increasingly working relationship with David and Liz, which is a great blessing to me. Uh, and I'm sure they are a great blessing uh, to you. And um, if, if for any reason they're not, that's because you're not praying for them hard enough. So <laughs> not because of anything that they're doing. But I'm, I'm confident, in confidence, in saying that they are a great gift uh, to you. So thank you, David, for inviting me this evening. Uh, reading from uh, John's Gospel, chapter 21, and um, uh, beginning at the first verse. I'm reading from uh, the... ESV, the ever superior version, and uh, so if it doesn't quite align with uh, your Bibles, I apologise. I hope that you will bear uh, with me. After this, Jesus had just appeared to Jesus and Thomas before this, but after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other, uh, others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. We thank God for his word to us. Um, I don't know what you're like in the morning times. If we took a straw poll as to morning people and evening people, uh, we would probably be a 50-50 split. I know there's at least one farmer in the room who probably loves to get up at 3.30 in the morning and things like this and probably gets up even earlier than that to fast and pray and put the rest of us to shame. Uh, but for me, when the alarm goes off at 6.30 in the morning and I remember that I've got to get up earlier than I used to because I now have a son that goes to high school and I have to take him there across the city. 
Um, I do not rise full of zeal and purpose, ready for another glorious day in the Lord's service. Rather, I reach for the snooze button and become increasingly frantic as I can't find it in my dozy slumber. I wonder what you're like in the morning. Well, uh, these disciples have been working through the night fishing. It's at the break of day, verse 4 tells us. And uh, they have had, a, a, the disciples that is, an entirely, I was going to say fruitless, but fishless evening. Mm. Nothing has worked. They're experienced people. They know what they're doing. This is no amateur hour. They uh, are, are, are well trod in this profession. In a, a lake that they knew like the back of their hand, yet they catch nothing. Yet at the beginning of the new day, Jesus Christ meets them. At the beginning of a new day, Jesus Christ meets them. And for us, John's Gospel is just laced with layers and layers of rich symbolism, which we can easily just move over and not quite realise what he's trying to tell us. Uh, this passage is no different. It's laced with symbolism. It's a brand new day. John is telling us his experience of living three years with this man is enough to convince him that with Jesus Christ, uh, every uh, situation uh, the, the dullness, the bleakness of dusk, the darkness of the night can be transformed into a brand new day. Jesus is the Lord of new beginnings. He loves to make things new. He loves to transform and uh, renew. And here he is. Symbolically for Peter particularly and for the other disciples. At the beginning of a new day, a new beginning. When we were uh, in the, uh, uh, the COVID lockdowns, um, as you now know, we had three young children at, at home. One that was preschool, um, one that was midway through primary, and one that was, I think, in their first year, or maybe second year, of primary education. And uh, um, my wife uh, took on the role of homeschooling. And uh, she would be happy for me to tell you that um, it wasn't all sweetness and light. <laughs> um, she showed incredible patience and resilience and innovation to make the same old Groundhog Day new and fresh and inspiring. Well, I hid upstairs in my makeshift study doing important ministry work. <laughs> uh, and every now and again, you would hear uh, the the, the squabbles of the children, or occasionally the squabbles of my wife as well, um, and the squabbles of, of me as we uh, wrestled with being confined uh, to the house. Not a unique experience. Uh, but uh, my wife used to say uh, to each of our children in that uh, strange time, and at the beginning of, uh, of COVID, for health reasons, I was uh, not even leaving the house even for shopping or exercise. Um, she would say to them, right then children, each day is a brand new start. Whatever squabbles we've had, whatever rows we've had, whatever anxieties we were carrying, like so many in uh, the population at the time. Forget the rows or arguments of yesterday. Today is a brand new day. Today is a brand new day. Well, I don't know. I imagine that the vast majority of people in this room have been walking with the Lord Jesus for many years. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord that no doubt you have got stories of his faithfulness and favour, of his kindness and his grace, of his power and his mercy that you could jump up uh, to tell right today. But whether you've been walking with the Lord a long time, whether you have been uh, newly converted, or whether you're yet to be convinced, of the claims of Jesus Christ. It's good news for each and every one of us that he offers a, and repeated, brand new starts. Is it not? The lecturing passage for this morning, I believe, was from Acts chapter 2. It's Peter preaching in Jerusalem. And he, uh, after he says, uh, 
God has made this man whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. It's, it's the culmination of his great Pentecost sermon. And the first uh, thing that happens is the people are cut to the heart and they say, what should we do? Peter's reply is, repent and be baptised, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Praise God. Praise God that the gospel is still a gospel of grace to you and me today. That whether we need to make our first U-turn or our 25th U-turn of today or our 20,000th U-turn of our lives, God's grace and his mercies are new every morning. Amen. Great Amen. is his faithfulness. But there may also be some things, uh, much as we revel in the grace of God, much as we celebrate in song and uh, celebrate with prayers of thanksgiving the fresh and new grace of God at, at present every hour, available every minute, there's also a responsibility in uh, living a repentant life and embracing a new beginning to leave some things behind. Just wonder whether there may be uh, some people here this evening, and I'm not going to call anybody out in a, a public uh, setting like this, but I wonder whether you know the moving of the Holy Spirit around your heart and mind in recent days and weeks. Is there something that you're perpetuating which you know is not God-honouring? You know the unsettledness of your spirit. You know the conviction of sin. You know that God actually very graciously is putting his finger on it and he's saying, there's a new beginning for you always. But actually it's time to leave that behind and turn away from it. Are there habits that you need to lie down? Are there things from your past that actually need to be cut adrift? Well, today is a day of opportunity. It might be uh, closer to dusk than it is to dawn. I haven't done the maths. But... Today is a day of grace. Today is a day of new beginnings. Jesus Christ comes and wants to do a new thing. And he wants to do it now, in the here and now. And when the disciples allow him to speak, and when they allow him to, uh, uh, when they choose to follow his commands, when they, when they choose to embrace that new beginning that Jesus offers, as we read, they find themselves with an abundance of blessing. Jesus Christ meets us each day and he stands ready and willing to meet each of us now. Secondly, uh, Jesus meets us uh, in uh, mission. Jesus meets us in mission. The key message of this passage is that there is a new start that is available for everyone. Uh, and uh, um, but then we move on to this curious catch of fish. Any fishermen in the room? Any? Yeah, one fisherman, great. I'm a, a huge fan of the fisherman's friends. Yeah, yeah I've got their music playing as I drove over today. There's at least one person scowling in disbelief, but I won't pick them out. Um, <laughs> God bless you, sir, in the back corner. But uh, uh, yeah, no. Um, uh, well, uh, we get it. Why? In all the generalizations of the gospel, does the writer uh, uh, of John fixate on these 153 fish? And what on earth did it mean? Let me tell you, there are people that have made a living yes. out of trying to translate what this number 153 yes. means. Yes. There are people in, in, uh, in academia, in theological colleges, writing books all over the place. What does it mean? Well, can we not just settle on the fact that 153 is quite a lot? Uh, we'd be glad, uh, you know, uh, if there are 153 people here tonight, we'd be glad, wouldn't we? Yes. We've got 153 birthday presents, next time it's uh, uh, our turn, we'd be glad, wouldn't we? <laughs> well, um, it, it's just a lot. <laughs> That's what it means. It's a lot. Uh, the main theme uh, links with Jesus' promise in Matthew 4, that he is going to send us out to fish for people. Worth noting, that's a, a, a promise, not an invitation, actually. It's a command. And Jesus is telling us what is about to happen, not would you like to join me. But come, I, and follow me, I will make you, uh, in the old language, fishers of men. Uh, fishers for people. So, probably the most important thing here is not the number of fish, 
but that the church is the net, allegorically speaking, metaphorically speaking, and that therefore in this great net, when I talk about the church, I mean the church of Jesus Christ, not Lanson Central or Lord Seston, whichever one of them is today. Thank you, brother, amen to you. But, uh, um, no, what was I talking about? Anyway, uh, no, no, when we talk about the, you know, the, the church, we talk about the church of Jesus Christ, and within uh, that great and all-encompassing net of the church, there is room there for an abundance of people. All types of people, all types of backgrounds can find out home in the kingdom of God. Now the problem with that is that we can, it can tempt us to think of people as objects, like fish. They're just projects to be one. Kind of a transactional way of thinking about evangelism. Um, so there's a weakness there. But the, the message to God's people is that there are a number of people around who need to hear from us or need to see in us, lived out, or maybe both, uh, the good news that there is a new beginning possible with Jesus Christ. So Paul says, um, uh, how will they call if they have never heard? We sing it in the great old hymn, don't we? We quote that. Go forth and tell. I haven't sung that for a few years. I have a word with the worship leaders at, uh, at Central Hall. How were they called if they have never heard? And friends, let me remind you that the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, born of Mary, crucified on the cross, buried in the tomb, risen again and ascended as law, that gospel message is still effective. It has not lost its power. I had a, a great privilege of sitting in two alpha groups I mentioned earlier this week. I'm not leading them. Uh, in both cases, lay people uh, uh, in our organisation at Central Hall are leading these alpha courses. It was the last week, what about the church? They thought we better roll the vicar in, we're desperate. <laughs> so there I get rolled in. You don't have to do anything but just sit and be there. And uh, in both courses, the respective leaders asked these people, none of whom were in church uh, at Christmas time. So again, we're talking eight or nine people, not 153, but I'll take eight and nine. Tell me about your experience of God. Tell me about your experience of Jesus over the last 10 weeks. And there are people there, handful of them, uh, that came as seekers or skeptics and are now saying, I believe in Jesus. Amen. Have they got everything sorted out? No. Have they got problems in their lives still? Yes. But they have discovered in this wonderful Saviour that he offers them, like he does to us, a new beginning. And I, I, you know, I think, how on earth would I cope if it wasn't for Jesus? There wasn't something to pick me up and dust me down and um, and, and deal with all the propensity I have to uh, 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 make mistakes. Uh, you know, the good news is that God offers a new beginning. He offers uh, friendship, fellowship with God. He offers to bring us near in Jesus Christ. Uh, the gospel has not lost its power. It is life and health and peace to a world that is so needy and broken. The problem is not the message. I think there are, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, oh, forgive me, David, but there are times when I look at some of the stuff that is parroted out from London, and I think, they seem to think that we need to change the message. No! Yes. We might change how we package it, how we communicate it, how we share it, but the gospel has not lost its power. 
We still proclaim Christ crucified, risen and ascended. Yes. We proclaim him as Lord of all. Yes. And did you know that in the time that we've been together this evening, it'll be about an hour and if we shut up, we'll, if I shut up, we'll stick to about an hour, but um, uh, in, the, in the time that we have been together this evening, it is uh, around about three and a half thousand people somewhere on the planet will have confessed faith for the first time in Jesus Christ today. So those things may not be our everyday experience, but across the world, the gospel is bearing fruit. And so we rejoice and we have confidence in the gospel. We, we therefore cast the net out liberally, not worrying about what comes back as if it's uh, our fault. Look, Jesus doesn't come along and say, oh, you fishermen, you have failed. Oh, how dare you? You have done it wrong. Blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. He just says, just try again, lads. Leave it to me. Jesus is in charge of the results here. Right? We, we offer ourselves. We, 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 we kind of um, uh, fling out the net. But we trust God <laughs> to do what he wants to do mm. with that which we offer. And so, friends, I wonder whether God wants you to go on a fishing trip. I don't mean go down to Megabissi or wherever it is and get on a boat. Um, probably not Megabissi. Anyway, uh, somewhere coastal. Um, but I ask you, seriously, where is it that God has placed you that he might want you to throw out the net? Now, it might not be a net that's going to reach 150 people. It might be one. You know, there are some people, aren't there, that go, in, certainly off the, off the hoe in Plymouth, there are people that go fishing with kind of a little crabbing bucket. And then there are trawlers that go out into the sand to kind of catch industrial levels. Well, it needs all sorts. Might be the God wants you to throw your little crabbing bucket out. He said, I'm stretching this metaphor a bit, aren't I? But you know what I mean. You know, who is it that you work with? Who is it that you grandparent? Who is it that you live next to? Who is it that you go to Probus Club with or Rotary or something? Who is it that the Lord has placed next to you who actually he's saying, come on, come on, let's go fishing, shall we? Let's throw out the net and see what happens. And you know, we may be disappointed, we may be unmoved, we might also be amazed as the disciples were with the extent of the catch. And then if you'll uh, uh, allow me just one more thing, uh, Jesus uh, meets us each day with a new beginning, Jesus meets us in mission, and then Jesus meets us with grace. And people may well say then, as we cast out the net, well what's so great about this Jesus? Well, in an answer, uh, uh, we can see our answer to that in the way that Jesus deals with Peter. And for most of us, the last time we've seen Peter, I know we know the story, but the last time we've seen Peter, probably, is Monday Thursday. You can only imagine that sense of wretched shame that Peter felt as he was asked, Do you know me? Do you know him? Oh, no, 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 nothing to do with me. Are you sure? Because you speak a bit like him. No, no, honestly. Do you know, you were with him, weren't you? No, 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 nothing to do with him. I swear I never knew him. In the the film, The Passion of the Christ. It's not a perfect film. There is this deeply poignant moment as Peter makes his denial and across the fire his eyes meet Jesus being dragged through by the Roman guards. Can you imagine? Well, that's just imagining that scene, but can you imagine that sense of deep shame that Peter feels? Maybe there's some of us here today that are carrying a sense of shame and we're wondering what God could ever want to do with us. Well, let's read the story. Jesus goes to the heart of that shame. He doesn't just airbrush it from the side. He goes deep within it. Where do we find Peter on Monday, Thursday evening? He's by a fire, warming his hands, we read. How does Jesus greet him on the beach? He's got a fire going meets him right in that place of pain. Peter denied Jesus three times. 
Jesus restores him three times. You know, this, Jesus kind of confronts this at the heart of, of the letter. It just tells us that there is <coughs> plentiful grace here in the eyes and words of Jesus for a plentiful sinner like Peter. And, and I can tell you, forgive me for referring to myself again, that I am a plentiful sinner. But thank God that he is a plentiful saviour. And that's true for each and every one of us, I expect. That the risen Jesus meets us. And because he has been crucified, died and was buried, because he is raised up again from the dead, sin cancelled, death defeated, life eternal, opened and offered for us all, he is able to uh, pour into our lives grace upon grace. And Paul said, where sin abounds, grace abounds mm -hmm. all the more. Mm -hmm. Are we grateful? There is no one too bad. There is no one too sinful. There is no one too far away. Here, maybe for yourself, or pass on the invitation to others, these simple words of Jesus, come have breakfast, come sit with me, come eat with me, come let's feast. Charles Wesley wrote these wonderful words, and with that uh, I better uh, close. He said, come sinners to the gospel feast. Let every soul be Jesus' guest. You need not one be left behind. For God hath bidden all mankind. Jesus meets Peter with incredible grace. He meets us as we join him uh, uh, on mission. And he meets us every day offering us a new beginning. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.